Welcome everyone to our seminar on Latin America social policies and political regimes in the wake of COVID-19. We have uh, the pleasure of having with us Nora Lustig, who's the Samuel Stone Professor of Latin American Economics in the Department of Economics at Tulane University, and the Director of the Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane University, and a, resi a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development and the Inter-American Dialogue. She also had a very long uh, resume that I don't need to uh, repeat since she's pretty well known. We also have with us as Steven Levitsky, who's a professor of government at Harvard University. Uh, he's a comparativist and a political scientist, and he has written tons of books, most recently, When Democracies Die, as well as one uh, much more recent called The Politics of Institutional Weakness in Latin America. It's a pleasure to have you both with us here. I just want to make some uh, uh, initial announcements. Uh, first, this event is going to is being recorded as we speak. It's also being posted on Facebook, on our ELAS page, page in Facebook. And the recording will be available on YouTube by participating in the event. You're agreeing to the recording of the event. We also are going to be having the questions uh, in the question and answer uh, a function of Zoom. So if you write your questions there, I'm going to be gathering questions and asking them to the two presenters. Um, and I'm sorry to, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University and the chair of this panel on social policies and political regimes in the wake of the pandemic in Latin America. Welcome everyone. We will start with Nora, then we'll Steve will talk, and then we will open the conversation to questions and answers. All right, so shall I start? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Vicky and Ayla for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join you and uh, Steve, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, an interesting dialogue also with, uh, with the uh, audience, which now has about 70 participants. Uh, I will actually use a PowerPoint, as you know, because I want to present some results from uh, work that I've been doing. And it's easier if I show you a graph than if I just tell you what they are by Viva Voce, although I will accompany my graph with uh, Viva Voce descriptions. And what I'm going to be doing is um, share with you some results that we have on work that is looking at the distributional impacts of COVID-19 in Latin America, focused now on four, on the four largest countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. And this is a type of work that economists do when there's no data yet, you use something called micro simulations in which you kind of uh, try to replicate what you think is happening in the economy and see what happens to incomes and then to indicators that are of interest when uh, you actually let that micro simulation play through your, your data. Uh, so uh, as we know, you know, the situation in Latin America is pretty dire, actually. It's, I think, one of the worst hit regions in terms of uh, if you want the pandemic and the economic costs. And I say one of the worst, even though the advanced economies have been hit very hard also in terms of uh, the contractions that they're experiencing, they have much more in terms of resources to actually compensate with the, 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 with the contractions with the policies that rely on, on fiscal resources. So, Although, you know, when uh, I remember when I started working on this uh, in March, April, Latin America tended to be kind of on the lower end of the pandemic. Now we have the dubious uh, the privilege of being among the top in terms of infections and uh, death rates of the world. So it's become an epicenter, and uh, in some cases, we don't really understand why, but I'm not an epidemiologist, so I am not going to go into that discussion at all. In terms of uh, contraction, we see that, you know, the last IMF uh, economic outlook, which came out in, in June, I think, uh, predicted a 
contracted about nine, over 9% for the region. And then, you know, for the specific countries that I'm looking at here, it ranges to almost 10% in Argentina. You've seen the data for Argentina in the second quarter of the contraction at this point has been 19%. So we don't know what's going to be the uh, end of the story, given that they had to prolong the lockdowns much more than in initial envisioned. Brazil also about 9%, Colombia a little less, and Mexico is the highest in part because it's the country of all of Latin America that has decided not to implement any uh, counter-cyclical policy at the macro level, and it hasn't implemented, as we'll see, any counter-cyclical policy at the safety net level. Another thing that's been very, very concerning, in addition of all the health costs, is the fact that you've had so many children out of school and uh, that, uh, you know, in the discussion that you will have later, we'll probably delve on it because it has implications for long-term mobility and uh, inequality and poverty in the future. So the questions that we address in our uh, paper, which is cited here and it's already published, it's uh, with a couple of students of mine, Valentina Martinez, Federico Sanz, and a colleague uh, that works at the CEQ Institute, Steve Younger. First is, you know, what is the potential impact of the COVID-induced lockdowns on inequality and poverty? Who are the biggest losers? And to what extent does the expanded social assistance mitigate the impact? And uh, as I said, we use this uh, microsimulation method that's called the accounting framework because we do not uh, model behavior responses from people as they get hit by the shock. We assume things are in a way frozen in the short term. Uh, summary of key results are, you know, the large, there was a large negative impact of the crisis on poverty and inequality potentially. Uh, interestingly, the biggest losses are not among the poorest, but in what we would call the middle of the distribution, which include primarily the moderate poor and households who are vulnerable to poverty, but also those in the middle class. And what's also very important is to uh, pinpoint the fact that expanded social assistance has been able to mitigate the impact a lot in Brazil, quite a bit in Argentina, much less in Colombia, and zero in Mexico. So uh, this is a graph that a lot of people like because it's, this is a situation before the shock on how uh, people, uh, you know, families, gross income gets distributed. It's a composition of sources of income. And uh, the orange is the cash transfers. So the cash transfers are providing a floor for particularly the poor and the extreme poor that wasn't there before. So we are in a different place, if you want, if you compare it to the previous uh, episodes of crisis in the region in which those uh, programs didn't exist, like Asignación Universal por Hijo in Argentina, Bolsa Familia in Brazil, uh, Familias en Acción in Colombia, and in Mexico, right now you have an assortment of uh, categorical, categorically targeted programs because, as you know, Lopez Obrador did away with, uh, with Prospera. The next two uh, items in this uh, distribution of the, it's the composition, you know, you have 100% of income. So what is it that every centile uh, receives by classified from poorest to, to richest? The gray are pensions. The light blue are government salaries. The green are income from the private sector that in principle is not at risk. And the dark blue is what's at risk. So we immediately can see that, you know, and risk tends to sort of increase. It happens a little bit like a U-shape that covers, uh, like I said, the middle deciles, which can range from, you know, the second, third decile up to the eighth, depending on, on the country. So then uh, what happens once you subject uh, the countries to the shock of the, of the lockdowns through, I'm not gonna go into the model that we, I mean, if anybody has questions, we, I can describe how this was done. And uh, you know, here are the social assistance programs that we have included. They're not exhaustive, they're the most important ones. And you know, I just wanna point out to the fact that in the case of Brazil, this auxilio emergencial is huge. It covers a lot of people and it costs about 2% of GDP, which is a large amount and probably not sustainable in the longer run. I mean, we know that it may not, it's not gonna be sustainable. 
case of Argentina, they're also spending around 1% of GDP. In the case of Colombia, it's much less. And like I said, in the case of Mexico, there's no additional uh, programs or even expansion of the existing safety nets. What Mexico did is uh, pay an advance on a couple of programs uh, saying, you know, hopefully they will pay still at the end of the year, the amount and then it, they would have been con uh, converted into transfers exposed, but ex ante, they're not transfers, they're just advances. Okay, so what happens to poverty? Uh, I, you know, we did two scenarios because we don't know yet whether, I mean, you have an aggregate loss, which is what the uh, IMF forecasts for every country. And then, you know, it can either be the case that you have fewer families who get hit a lot or a lot of families who get hit by less. So we, since we don't know yet, because the uh, information is not available, but it will be soon. So I think we're going to be able to fine tune, fine -tune the, the simulations here. We produced the outcome for the two scenarios. One is called the concentrated losses, where fewer families lose a lot. And the other one we call them dispersed losses, where more families lose less. And the uh, anchor always is the aggregate contraction that is coming now from uh, IMF predictions. And what we can see is that, uh, you know, the, these uh, the, 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 the bars that have the diagonal lines are poverty headcount ratio here measured with a national poverty line for every country, ex ante before the shock. Then we have expose the shock. The gray is the concentrated losses. The red is the dispersed losses. And then what happens after you included the mitigation coming from the expanded social assistance, which is the case of the third uh, two bar, the three, the two bars that are uh, in the, at the third uh, of this, of this graph. And what we can see is that, well, I mean, the shock is important. But in both in Argentina and Brazil, the mitigation policies are able to do quite a bit. In the case of Colombia, much less. And in the case of Mexico, which shows uh, here again is with the national poverty line, the biggest increase, there's no, no, uh, no compensation. And so there is no uh, exposed uh, safety nets uh, results. With the international poverty line, which is lower in every country than the national, except in the case of Colombia, I want to point out that for Brazil, we get a fascinating result, which is if we live in the world of dispersed losses, actually the headcount ratio after the uh, social assistance programs would be lower than before the pandemic. And, you know, this has been actually found also by some uh, local researchers from IPEA and also from the Getulio Vargas. So they're saying that this program is so large that maybe it's doing more than what uh, Bolsa Familia was doing before the pandemic hit. We don't know what's gonna happen if this situation becomes more protracted. This, you know, sort of this is a photo of what happened if we take what uh, occurred during the first quarter based on the predictions of the IMF for, uh, for the first two quarters, based on the predictions that IMF made on the recovery in the second half of the year. As for inequality, we also have the extant inequality here. And by the way, for Argentina, as you know, we only have urban data because that's the household service are only for urban areas. And then we have what happens as an impact without the expanded uh, social assistance Again, for the concentrated losses, the dispersed losses, what happens after we include the uh, expanded social assistance. And again, what we can see, well, I mean, no, one thing that's obvious and you would expect is that the losses are very concentrated. The impact on inequality is going to be higher because it means that some families that had some, whatever income they had, they're closer to zero and that affects a lot the inequality measures, in this case, the Gini coefficient. And the dispersed losses you have, you're sharing if you want the burden of the, of the lockdowns. Uh, but what's interesting again is the fact that in the case of Argentina and Brazil, the expanded social assistance is mitigating to a 
certain degree that is not trivial what's happening to inequality. And again, in the case of Brazil, if the world we live is a dispersed losses, inequality exposed, including the shock and the expanded social assistance would be lower than pre-pandemic. Again, this is something what I cannot see. What is, does it say? Yeah, I'm, I'm about to finish. So the third thing that uh, I wanted to show is who, what's the distribution of income and losses. And here, you know, this is a measure of mobility because I'm keeping fixed the ranks of households by per capita gross income ex ante. And then I look at what happens to every centile in terms of the losses before the safety nets and before and after the expansion of social assistance. And the red solid lines are what happens before I consider the expanded social assistance and the dotted one is after. And as I said in my introductory uh, slide, well, you can see that in general, we have like a U-shaped pattern in terms of the first impact. And that's because we had, I remind you, oops, this cushion, particularly the, the orange cushion is the one that's doing a lot. Uh, because here, by the way, we did not include uh, consumption of own production. We have another paper from Mexico where we include that, and that's even then, the cushion is even bigger because rural areas have that very prominently, as we know. Uh, but it's that same thing that income floor is there. And uh, exposed, you know, the, after the expanded uh, social assistance, we see that at the very bottom, the very, very, very poor are getting an income that uh, it makes them, I mean, it leaves them at a higher level if you want that the ex ante. Uh, the losers start in after the first decile. So the first decile seems to be relatively protected in the case of Argentina and Brazil, less in Colombia, nothing in Mexico. But you know, the people that are after the first decile are also people who can risk being uh, poor and extreme poor and maybe unable to jump back. Of course, those who are in this part of the distribution, we would expect them that they have savings, so they're compensating it with savings, or they can borrow, and they're also probably better positioned to come back uh, to their pre-pandemic position after things get better. The problem is what's gonna happen in this part of the distribution in the countries that are being uh, affected. And in the case of Mexico, it's everybody who's <laughs> losing. So in the case of Mexico, it's, uh, probably the most dramatic of all. So let me stop here and uh, we can come back and uh, re reconvene on you know, what the conclusions are and then talk about the longer run. Thank you, Nora. I'm let's, gonna stop sharing them. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen yes, now. Okay? Let's have Steve uh, make his remarks and we already have some questions. So after that, we will bring the questions to start the conversation. Okay, thank you, uh, Vicky. Thank you to Elas. It's a real honor to be here, uh, both with Vicky and with Nora. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I'll speak for nine or 10 minutes at most so we can get to questions. Um, COVID 19 initially looked like a real death knell for liberal democracy. The pandemic seemed like a perfect scenario for a presidential or prime ministerial power grab. Basic civil liberties, including freedom of association, pretty much had to be suspended. In a few cases, elections had to be postponed, and governments across the world, democratic and non-democratic, had to resort to decrees in order to enforce public health measures. So emergency measures, the emergency itself, seemed to create an easy justification for suspending democratic rights and democratic procedure. And of course, it's really easy to find a lot of historical precedent for governments using crises to subvert democracies, not just Hitler, Alberto Fujimori, used the hyperinflation and the shining path to justify his Alpha Volpe in the 1990s. Putin and Erdogan used terrorist attacks to justify authoritarian measures in the early part of the 21st century. But so far, our initial fears, or many of our initial fears of kind of a quick death of democracy have, for the most part, not been realized. Uh, Viktor Orban very famously suspended parliament in Hungary. A few leaders, uh, most notably Duterte in the Philippines, Bukele in El Salvador, clearly use the crisis to, to weaken opponents and to concentrate power. But authoritarian responses have not been terribly widespread in Latin America or elsewhere. And in fact, at the same time, the pandemic has weakened several either uh, autocrats or would-be autocrats. So the Iranian regime has been weakened. 
Bolivia's de facto government has been pretty badly weakened. Putin has lost support. Uh, obviously, Lukashenko in, in Belarus faces unprecedented opposition. And crucially, I think for Latin America, the Trump administration has lost public support. In early 2020, for the pandemic, Donald Trump had at least a 50% chance of reelection, uh, in large part because the US economy was booming. Uh, but thanks to Trump's response to the pandemic, he is now in political trouble. That could have important and I think positive consequences for global democracy. A Biden government would not be a panacea in any sense for global democracy. But if Trump loses, the United States would at least stop embracing the illiberal forces that are assaulting democracy in much of the world. We would at least stop being a force for authoritarianism. Um, so the pandemic hasn't yet done a lot of short-term damage to democracy in Latin America or elsewhere. In, in, in the short run, it's sort of, I think it's more frozen politics than it has disrupted it. But I worry a lot about the medium run. Um, so Latin American democracies may, may not be suffering what Guillermo O'Donnell used to call a, the quick death, but uh, the pandemic may well contribute to a slow death. Um, and let me elaborate a little bit on that. Most Latin American democracies remain pretty fragile for several reasons, reasons that are well known. First of all, most of the region has not achieved sustainable economic growth. Many countries in the region remain very vulnerable to economic crisis. Secondly, as pointed out, Latin American societies continue to be marked by extraordinarily high levels of inequality. And third, most Latin American democracies have pretty weak states, which among other things, undermines government performance and generates pretty unusually high levels of public discontent. All three of these vulnerabilities are likely to be exacerbated in the months and probably years to come. The coming years, I'm not an economist, but it seems likely that the coming years are gonna be uh, pretty difficult ones economically. We're entering probably a period somewhat akin to the 1980s and early 90s, a period of, of sluggish growth and probably pretty severe fiscal crisis. That could have a devastating impact on social spending, on distribution. It may not, ha it has, in some countries, as Nora pointed out, hasn't everywhere. But if this fiscal crisis is prolonged, uh, at least my expectation is it's going to have a pretty serious effect on social spending and redistribution. State agencies, uh, without question, will be strained. And probably public perceptions of, gov of government performance, which are already pretty low across the region, will worsen. This is a really important point. Governing with a weak state, governing with an ineffective state, is hard even in the best of times. But governing with a weak state that is also bankrupt is almost impossible. You end up like Alfonsín, De La Rua, Silas Suazo, Ana Garcia, first Ana Garcia, Jamil Maquad. So Latin America is likely headed for a period of pretty poor economic performance, fiscal crisis, reduced social spending, rising inequality, deepening public disaffection. That will very likely erode public confidence in democratic governments and in democratic institutions. The thing that worries me is that democratic institutions were already in a pretty fragile state before the pandemic. And this is what I want to kind of highlight. I want to highlight three pretty disturbing trends that were already underway before the pandemic hit and that were likely to be exacerbated. One of them I already alluded to, widespread public discontent over government performance and in many cases over a general lack of responsiveness among the political elite. In much of Latin America, there is a growing perception that democratic governments were unable or unwilling to resolve basic problems, problems like crime, problems like corruption. So before the pandemic in, the, in 2018, 2019, these perceptions contributed to pretty large scale protests in Chile and Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador and elsewhere, and also led to the election of, of, of illiberal outsiders in El Salvador and Brazil. Uh, the pandemic almost certainly will further erode public confidence in democratic governance, governments which will strengthen the position, the electoral position, the political position of populist and maybe military figures who promise to resolve people's problems by other means. So public discontent over government performance is likely to get worse. Secondly, amid deepening polarization, we've seen a disturbing rise in what I call constitutional hardball, the use of the letter of the law in ways that subvert its spirit. In other words, politicians increasingly we're weaponizing institutions in ways that threaten democracy. A few examples, the politicized impeachment of Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, the legal shenanigans used to keep Lula out of the 2018 presidential race, 
the exclusion of two major candidates from the Peruvian election in 2016. Efforts by Peru's Congress to remove two consecutive presidents on the grounds of moral incapacity and President Vizcarra's dubiously constitutional closure of Congress last year. Juan, uh, Orlando Hernandez and Evo Morales' use of packed judiciaries to declare the constitutionality of their dubiously constitutional re-election bids. These are some pretty dangerous precedents being set, particularly, I want to stress the area of candidate exclusion. Once you open the door to barring major candidates from the race, democracy is in real trouble. This is a serious issue today in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Honduras, in Brazil, in Peru, and it may well become one elsewhere. Finally, and most frighteningly, Latin American militaries are re-entering the political arena, not everywhere, but in a disturbing number of cases. Across much of the region, politicians are turning to the military, either as an arbiter of political conflict or for outright political support. Now, Salvador Bukele has used the military to bully Congress. In Peru, President Vizcarra used statements by the army and, and photo ops, high profile photo ops with army leaders to strengthen his position and his standoff with Congress. Just last week, the president of the Peruvian Congress called the military to try to get its support in, in its effort to remove Vizcarra from office. In Honduras, the military has helped to keep President Hernandez in power despite clear evidence of, of, of pretty severe criminal behavior. In Bolivia, the military stepped in to tell Evo Morales to, to quit. In Brazil, military officials put their thumb on the scales in the legal investigation against Lula, uh, and they were and they're increasingly seen as arbiters in the political conflict under Bolsonaro. Brazilian Congress people tell me that one reason why Congress has not moved to impeach Bolsonaro is the knowledge, is their knowledge that a sector of the military would resist that. This is a really troubling development. One of Latin America's greatest achievements in the last 40 years has been pushing the military out of politics. It is really hard, really hard to establish civilian control over the military. Military officials played the role of arbiter, of, of moderating power for 150 years in much of Latin America. A return to that role, and we're seeing evidence of this, would have devastating consequences for democracy. So my fear is that growing public discontent will further weaken democratic politicians vis-a-vis -vis two actors. It'll weaken democratic politicians vis-a-vis -vis outsiders and it'll weaken democratic politicians vis-a-vis -vis militaries. This process was already underway before the pandemic, but my fear is that it will now accelerate. I don't think too many, I don't see too many clear reasons why it would not accelerate. Latin American democracies still have some, um, some strengths and some, some things going for them. Very few Latin Americans anywhere in the region want to give up their right to vote out governments that they don't like. Uh, only democracy gives Latin American citizens the right to do that. But I think this is now the biggest challenge to Latin American democracy since the beginning of the third wave in, in 35 or 40 years. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I will pose a couple of questions and then we'll go to the Q&A questions. There's already a bunch of them. So for, for Nora, I want you to talk a little bit about the long-term effects of COVID-19 in for poverty and inequality. You talk about the kind of short-term effects and also what policies could be implemented to deal with both the short and the long-term effects, given that as Steve described, the state is going to be pretty bankrupt when we go out of this situation. So fiscally, it's going to be difficult. And, and, and for Steve, my question has to do with your fear of outsiders. You describe a pretty weak state and a pretty, you know, not so successfully working democracy. Uh, outsiders have not done particularly good vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic. I would say Bukele, Bolsonaro, AMLO didn't do particularly well. I don't think they did worse either because a lot of people who thought was doing well at the beginning is doing so bad now. Um, <laughs> But to what extent do you think that maybe an outsider uh, that comes after the pandemic might be able to 
uh, reshape uh, democracy in a way that might not be deleterious, but may be good for democracy, like creating more stable parties in a country like Peru, which is incredibly fragmented, um, or even reshaping the role of the state in a country like Peru, where the state has almost no role and has been very weak, even though when it was fiscally sustainable. So, uh, you know, I want to play the, that, that, put that question to you. So why don't we start with Nora, then we move to Steve, and then I open to the questions in the Q&A. Yeah, I think, you know, Vicky, it might be interesting if we start directing the conversation of the interactions that can happen between the political uh, scenario that Steve just described, which is quite ominous, you know, <laughs> if I, I might say, even though not... Uh, devastatingly so, but it is very worrisome. And what are the sort of distributional trends that actually will feed into this as well? So in the longer term, I think that um, we might be able to uh, sort of see some, as the economy begin to recover, we don't know when it's gonna happen, by the way, given the uncertainty also surrounding what's happening with the virus itself. Uh, that uh, that is uh, something that we have to be very well aware. We were not out of the woods at all on the epidemiological front. If one would expect some of the sort of drastic poverty impacts to start to sort of uh, be mitigated just by recovery, but poverty will be higher. And it looks like in the inequality in sort of the next couple, two, three, four years will also be higher. But particularly, I think that there's going to be a group of people who've lost are going to be very uh, angry or you know, frustrated because they're not going to be able to bounce back to where they were before. Um, in terms of policies, you're right. I think that the rightly done huge countercyclical policies at the macro level and also at the if you want uh, social assistance level, safety net levels that we've seen were the right policies in the context partly of Argentina and Brazil, they try to do as much as possible, like I said, much less in the case of Colombia, none in the case of Mexico, but uh, that's not sustainable. So uh, what we might see is that, yeah, I mean, the impact will be less in terms of what's happened in the market because there will be recovery eventually, but uh, the compensatory policies will not be there. And I think we're gonna discuss a little later, you know, who's gonna pay for all this and therefore maybe the net uh, benefit to people will be even lower than, than what the social assistance, social protection, when you just look at the spending side, and somebody will have to pay for what we're spending now. That uh, in a, in a context of lower growth, the fiscal space will also be lower because revenues are gonna be lower with demands higher. So we're gonna be in a very bad state. Uh, another uh, effect in terms of longer term that concerns me a lot. So the policies are gonna, I mean, let me just say something about uh, the, the so, so this dilemma about should we have a UBI or should we continue with this targeted policies? I think it would be lovely to have a UBI, but uh, like I said, always the universal basic income is at the expense of spending more resources on the poor. So while a universal basic income might be good for providing a social protection floor for all, it is going to take away, because the same amount of money if you spend it targeted wise, it takes away resources from the poor, not just in cash, but also other measures that you may want to introduce in this process, given that the poor are deprived in so many other dimensions, dimensions that have been exacerbated now. And let me talk about the long term, education. The closure of schools has been so unequal in terms of what people could do vis-a-vis -vis that uh, supply you know, constraint, which was a result of having to implement policies to contain the spread of the virus, that uh, for families or for children that live in families that um, had connectivity and also had educated parents, the ability to actually replace schooling by homeschooling maybe was almost 100%. But for the uh, poor, maybe they were unable to replace it at all. So you have generated an inequality that will actually have an impact on mobility and on the ability of this generation that's been hit 
to complete, for example, secondary school that uh, might be hard to reverse. And uh, we have done, I mean, you've seen the, the, some of the work uh, that we have done uh, in, in other seminars in terms of what uh, the effect on uh, sort of, for example, the probability of completing uh, high school. Uh, according to some of the estimates that we have, you know, you, the cohorts that are getting hit may be having the same probability as cohorts of the 1950s. So the retrogression, even though it is for this cohort and maybe the next, you know, people next year, the year after may not be affected, the damage for this group is gonna be very high. Uh, and so we're seeding, if you want, inequality and exclusion, we're seeding the, we're sowing the seeds of uh, inequality and exclusion in the longer run for the group that is being hit now. Therefore, I don't know what policies, I'm not an education specialist, but I think that one uh, extremely important uh, type of policies that policymakers, governments should focus on primarily, and not only governments, I think it's gonna have to be something more of a societal effort is, how do you remediate the effect on the group that was not able to replace schooling in different you know, stages of where they are in their, their, their uh, uh, schooling uh, process. And how do you deal with uh, the, if you have to continue using school closures in the future as a containment measure, how you do it in a way that you have the ability to replace schooling by something that will not constitute near zero as it's been now in most countries. Uh, otherwise, you know, the problem, the short-term problem will become a huge long-term problem. And I think that's where we need to, uh, I mean, the, and these are one of the most important long-term, but we have also, you know, what's happening to nutrition, what's happening to health, what's happening to uh, mental health in particular that also can have long lasting effects in terms of the ability of today's children to do well in the future. Okay, Steve. That's very depressing. Yes, it is. <laughs> you weren't I was a downer. Lifting either, Steve. Um, okay, outsiders. So, Vicky, I initially and probably naively uh, had this optimistic burst of hope that um, the very poor response of po of many populists to the pandemic would kind of serve as a a vaccination against populism in the in the medium term that uh, electorates would realize both not only in South America also in North America would realize that uh, experts do matter and that politicians who reject uh, science and expertise get society into trouble. Unfortunately, in Latin America, that um, seems not to be the case because for the reasons you you suggested, there were there are clear structural factors that were pushing most countries in Latin America uh, in, in a convergent direction, despite the initial policies. So Peru, which by most accounts uh, responded quite well initially, ended up in almost exactly the same place as Brazil, which, which responded. No, it's actually worse. Um, it's what? Actually worse. worse by some counts, yes. So, um, so, so a negligent reaction didn't get, didn't leave states much worse off than, than uh, a responsible reaction. So we're going to continue to get populists is the, is my prognosis. Um, you suggest Vicky, and you're not wrong that outsiders can bring a, a, a could, could do some good that uh, when outsiders come to power in a context of, of widespread disaffection, they usually come to power with a, a sort of a, a kind of a burst of legitimacy, public legitimacy, because they're not from this failed establishment that they just beat. And that creates an opportunity, it creates an opportunity to create new institutions. It creates an opportunity perhaps to, to build new parties. Um, and that happens once in a while, but most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time outsiders leave democratic institutions either the same or worse off for a few reasons. One, outsiders by and large uh, don't have much political experience. They're not socialized into either democratic norms or democratic practice. They're not very good. I'm generalizing here. They're not very good at negotiating. 
at power sharing. They're not very good at losing. Uh, they're not very good at taking criticism. Um, and, and those things matter in a democratic polity. Um, but also, in addition to the fact that their, their personal democratic skills tend to be limited, is um, they're often pretty weak. They're often weak because they, they don't have political parties. They rarely have much partisan support in the legislature. And in the years to come, unlike, say, Rafael Correa or Evo Morales, these guys in the years to come are going to come to power without many resources. And so it's very likely that a lot of them either will assault democratic institutions, as Bukele appears to be in El Salvador, or will simply be very weak and ineffectual, uh, more along the lines of Lugo in Paraguay or Lucio Gutierrez in, in Ecuador. Um, I think, you know, looking at the, the past 30 years in Latin America and elsewhere, the record of outsiders has, has been, is, is mixed, but uh, we don't have too many cases of, of effective democratic institution building. Okay, thank you, Steve. I'm going to ask some questions from the Q&A. First, um, Nora, you have one that's a uh, clarification question. Is how sensitive are the shown estimates of the impact on poverty sensitive to GDP contraction, considering that the IMF recognized that GDP contraction in Brazil will be much smaller than initially estimated? So that's a clarification question. Then I have a question here that actually it's, it's two people ask similar questions and it's, it could be for both. So Bolsonaro is right wing and Lopez Obrador is left wing, allegedly. And yet there has been many transfers in Brazil, though the Congress play, play a role there and nothing in Mexico. And, and someone else asked, uh, which I think is related, if this is related to the relatively high popularity of Bolsonaro, despite the, man, the, the way he handled the pandemic. Somebody asked that question as well. So if you want to, you know, first, uh, Nora, you want to clarify and then maybe talk a little bit about the differences mm -hmm. and then Steve, because these are proposals. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I mean, the projections are, or the uh, so simulations are definitely sensitive to the extent of uh, the aggregate shock. Uh, perhaps that's one of the uh, variables that makes them more sensitive to. So what uh, I think we are going to be doing is probably in the next round is to sort of produce a, a curve of possible uh, contractions. And uh, in some cases it may be worse, <laughs> in some cases it may be better. And uh, in the cases in which we better, what I'm showing you is more of an upper bound, in the other cases it's a lower bound, but they, they are sensitive. But we cannot go by anything else, but you know what people are forecasting at the aggregate level, and we chose to use the ones that were already published officially. There will be new ones in, in the annual meetings, and we're going to update our scenarios with the new ones, so stay tuned. Then. Uh, you know, I see Andy Zimbalis is the one that asked about Bolsonaro, and, and here I'm going to do something that I don't like to do, which is if I put a sort of a, a political scientist analysis, this is a coffee table one. <laughs> because they, I think that uh, for the, my, uh, AMLO doesn't have to do things to convince its base that he is their agent in power. He is someone who is really taking into account their interests. People are convinced that he is the one, as it's been shown uh, by the votes and also by his popularity, which even though it's come down, has resisted quite a bit given all what's been happening in the country. So I'm, I'm not surprised that he can get away with this. Uh, in, you know, not, not, and, and his view is that he doesn't want to do anything that puts him in a, in a sort of vulnerable position on the fiscal end. That's, uh, he doesn't, there are certain battles he's not ready to fight and he would not like to be subject to an IMF agreement in the future. I think that's his kind of like a, a bogus man. Bolsonaro on the other hand is not popular among the poor. So spending, it's a good way to actually get uh, more popularity. And as far as I could tell based on some of the polls, there has been 
a movement of uh, the poor in being more happy about Bolsonaro than they used to be after this huge program was, was put in place. So that's my two cents as a coffee table political scientist. And I'll stop here and let the real political scientist comment. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think Nora's coffee table political science may be better than my, than my real political science. Um, so I don't have all that much to add to that. Bolsonaro is definitely from the right, but he's from an illiberal right. He's, ne he's been always been uh, really kind of all over the map on markets and fiscal policy. I mean, he, was, he obviously has a, a, a sort of Chicago boy finance minister, but that is, he's never shown himself to be orthodox um, on, on fiscal policy. And it's also the case, as I think Vicky mentioned, that Congress played a big role in, in the expansion of these transfers as well. Um, and for sure, this has helped his popularity. I think sometimes we overstate how much he continues to be, as far as the, uh, the latest polls I've seen, less popular than AMLO in Mexico. Um, but uh, I think he's still, he's, he's climbed into the high 30s. He was in the low 30s. Um, but for sure, it, it, it's helped him. Um, AMLO's, it, I think, is explained pretty well by Nora's coffee table political science. On the one hand, so far, he hasn't really had a need. His popularity has, has declined a little bit, but really not much. It's still, most polls show him over 50%. Uh, his base seems solidly with him and uh, thus far, so, sort of like, Trump's face, he can do no wrong. I, I wonder how long this effect will last, though. If he continues to, um, to follow this fiscal policy, uh, the sort of Herbert Hoover policy, um, I, I don't know how long uh, his support will last. Um, I, and I, and Nora's absolutely right, though, about his reluctance to spend. He's got this sort of old school populist nationalist shtick about, about not wanting to be vulnerable. Uh, and so sort of holding on to, to, to the fiscal reins so as not to need to be bailed out by the AMF or anyone else. I think that by all accounts that I've heard, that explains a lot of his initial response. Okay, I have um, a, a couple of other questions. So Steve, somebody asked about what role do you think Trump plays here that you mentioned? Uh, in, in, in shaping the, the democratic outcomes in the region and, and makes, the question also makes reference to the recent election of the Inter-American Development Bank president. But in listening to you to talk about AMLO and also to Nora, it, your response seems to ignore the degree of integration between the Mexican and the American economies and how tied is to, to this Mexico, to the, whatever is the name of the NAFTA, New Trade Agreement, and how little agency any president of Mexico from the left or the right has in terms of policy making without being able to, you know, touch this very, very deep economic integration. And so that brings me to two other questions. So my first question is, what's the role of the US, both economically and politically? that has been asked. And then uh, uh, there's also a question here about uh, to what extent, or let's take this, this one first and then because the other is also complicated. So let's, let's take about the role of the US on both dimensions and then we'll take the other one. Steve? <laughs> Okay, I can speak. Uh, I'm not going to. It's an excellent point on uh, on Mexican U.S. integration, Vicky. I'm not going to speak because I know nothing. But I'll speak to, to the role of Trump in the U.S. politically. Um, it's it's the the role, the weight of the United States in regime outcomes in Latin America is not what it was in the 1990s. It's not remotely what it was in the 1990s uh, for a bunch of reasons. But but U.S. influence is uh, is is markedly down compared to what it was at the, in the uh, initial post-Cold War period. So we shouldn't overstate in any way the impact that, that uh, a U.S. government would have. But that said, um, the Trump administration is easily the least pro-democratic administration in the United States since Nixon. Um, it is at best, at best indifferent to regime in the region. Uh, and that at key moments, particularly in smaller states, uh, 
closer to the United States, uh, Caribbean, Central America, has had an impact. So uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez's ability to essentially steal an, a, a dubiously constitutional reelection was facilitated by the fact that Trump basically uh, embraced it. I mean, there was no there was no punitive action taken whatsoever. Um, as long as other Central American governments, whether it be Jimmy Morales or uh, Bukele or even Daniel Ortega, cooperate with Trump administration's goals in the region, particularly regarding immigration and, and, and drugs, um, they will have they will they will be they will face no consequences for their uh, for their authoritarian behavior. It's also the case that um, you know the United States has squandered an awful lot of of soft power over the years. It's, it's been a long time since the model the United States was viewed as much of a model of democracy. But you know, Trump has taken this descent to, to a new level uh, and has, has created a, a sort of anything goes uh, mentality across much of, of, of the region in terms of, of, of behavior. And this is clearly seen in Brazil. I was surprised by how many Brazilian um, politicians and colleagues have told me just how much these are all opponents of Bolsonaro, how much they um, are weighing the, the, the outcome of the U.S. election. They, they fear that Trump's re-election will be very consequential in terms of emboldening uh, Bolsonaro and his supporters, and that if, if Trump were to be defeated, that would, it wouldn't dramatically change things, but it, it, would, it would be an important step towards constraining or weakening Bolsonaro. So it does have some impact. Okay, Nora? Yeah, from the economic point of view, uh, I mean, it's, it's a long discussion about uh, why is it that uh, the kind of deep integration that's been going on now between Mexico and the US since uh, the start of NAFTA and whatever now, I also don't remember the name of the new one. Uh, but the weird thing is that uh, that integration has not resulted in the pay of the people expected in terms of uh, much higher growth for Mexico. We have not seen convergence. Uh, Mexico has not grown for, I mean, that's a big mystery what's happened. Why is it that something that should have resulted in uh, a much better outcome for Mexico, it hasn't happened. Having said that, I do think that, and this is uh, some of the macroeconomists are arguing, that probably the counter-cyclical policy for the, for, the, for the AMLO regime is what the U.S. is doing. Because even though Mexico has not converged, if the U.S. does badly, it does very badly. When, Mexico, uh, when the U.S. does badly, Mexico does very badly. So a recovery in the U.S. is going to actually help a recovery in Mexico. So some, some people are arguing that AMLO is piggybacking on the recovery policy in the U.S. rather than spending his own fiscal resources. That's a, 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 a very uh, surprising but interesting response. Well, I, I mean, you've seen that uh, when yeah. I was saying that AMLO has not picked uh, some of the battles and some, some he yeah. has. One clear battle he has not picked uh, up is one with the Trump administration. Right? Certainly. He's been very careful about that. So he chooses his battles carefully. Certainly. Okay, there is a question or a, a series of questions. I think Alan Clatterbach asked about black swans, uh, yeah. but here the question would be more about crisis and opportunity, what you don't see coming that might be coming. Um, and Andres Eskipani suggests that the economy will be completely different after COVID, right? There's going to be many firms that will never reopen. So when you think about social policy as short term and a lot of these, the IFE and the auxiliary, uh, uh, Brazilian aux emergency auxiliary, whatever is the name, that's, it's, it's also short term. They have already cut the value in half. Uh, but these people will not be able to come back to work because these works, many of them will disappear. So that's, you know, the crisis seems even more dire that, than you suggest if you, if you think of this as a kind of critical juncture. On the other hand, the critical juncture of state weakness, we already have weak states in Latin America, might be so bad that maybe civil society could come up with a, an alternative. I, I can think of, you know, states in which um, 
I mean, the example is the 1985 earthquake in Mexico City. So the state couldn't do anything and civil society organized to try to provide some, uh, you know, uh, relief. And that organization was important for the transition to democracy in Mexico. So to what extent you see the kind of the, the negatives being much worse and, and these short-term measures or contracyclical measures to be inadequate given the change in the economy and where there is an opportunity of something coming from the societal side of the equation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the weakness of the states. So who wants to take it first? Why don't you decide, Vicky, I don't know. Okay, so why don't you start and then stay? Okay, so uh, I wonder, I mean, uh, Alan's question, uh, I wonder whether he was thinking of um, his, he, he probably has a black swan in mind. Uh, the only thing that I can think may be coming out as something good of this uh, horrible situation is the fact that there, it's, it, you know, the pandemic made you conscious, made everybody conscious that exclusion is something that can actually get you stuck in the pandemic because if you don't deal with the virus everywhere, you're not going to be able to actually defeat it anywhere in the end. Uh, and that may be a lesson that might help us at least address some of the social challenges with a even more um, cooperative position on the part of those who are going to have to pay for it. Because, I mean, like I said, who's going to pay in the future for things that are needed uh, going uh, into the future then? The, what economists call the externalities of the pandemic. So if you have people that before you didn't care if they were okay, they were bad. I mean, I mean, I mean Singapore is actually a very interesting case, remember? Singapore did beautifully in con con sort of a, a containing the spread of the virus, but they had forgotten the migrants. And then suddenly the migrants were getting sick like hell. And that was a source of uh, problems that uh, they had to uh, contain and realize that they had not had in the radar screen, part of the group, which is not in the radar screen usually. And that's been the case, I think, in many of our uh, societies. So I hope that may be something that will leave with a positive, if you want, result. The fact that there are externalities, so dealing with the excluded is also good for you, not just for the excluded, to put it you know, in very simple terms. Um, and what was the second question? I forget. No, the, the, well, that the, the first question was to what extent these policies that we are contracyclical to deal with just the emergency situation. Oh yeah, right. Are going to be no, I mean, I don't have, when, yeah. you know, the, I, I, I see you know. the many jobs that exist. This is from Andre, Andre from Spani. Spani. Yeah. It, I don't have quantitative results, but I think that given that the pandemic may last longer than what we thought, we don't know yet, then the fact that uh, the sustainability of some of these programs is not going to be feasible because of fiscal constraints, I think the situation may become more dire in the future. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's you know, all I can say for now. Okay, Steve? So uh, it's, uh, it's a tough question. I think it's, it's a fair statement uh, and it's almost certainly a correct statement that politics will be reshaped in ways that we can't predict. By, uh, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, and hopefully there'll be some positive outcomes that, uh, that emerge from it. But we, we, I, I couldn't possibly stand here and predict the, 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 turn, the, the direction that, that it will turn. So yes, crises create opportunities. Yes, uh, in some cases, and everyone keeps coming back to Mexico 1985, civil society emerges and effectively substitutes for the state in some areas. Um, I, mo I continue to be mostly pessimistic though uh, in part because of the uh, really severe fiscal crisis that I think is coming, and in part because, as Nora just said, we don't know when this pandemic is going to end. But as long as it persists, uh, it, it, it inhibits at least traditional collective action in a, ways that, in a way that earthquakes do not, right? It's harder, um, not impossible, but it's harder today for the entire neighborhood to gather together in a, in a community center to, to plan out a response. So um, it's certainly possible that, and, and there are reasons to think why 
we might get a sort of spur of, of collective action from below, but it's pretty difficult in a pandemic. Um, and so I'm not going to um, sort of place a lot of hope in that direction. Thank okay, you. I think that's, uh, that was the last question and it's really exact time. I think we have been very, very punctual. Uh, and I think it ends in at least the hopeful note that the pandemic will uh, bring changes in civil society and changes in politics that will figure out the situation in which we are, which is not that, that hopeful. Um, and I'm very, very thankful to, to Nora and to Steve for their great presentations. I also want to uh, pass the note that for this book that I mentioned at the beginning, we have a book presentation also here, that means virtually, <laughs> the ILAS, next Thursday at 4 p.m. So you are all invited to come. There are going to be several authors talking about the chapters, in addition to Steve, myself, and Dan Brings. And there's also tons of activities. Please follow us on Twitter and Facebook, on Instagram, at the Institute for Latin American Studies. This is, again, Vicky Murillo, and it's a pleasure to have you all have shared with us these fantastic presentations and conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. And thank you, everybody. Hasta pronto. Ciao, hasta luego.